Hello and welcome back to Lord Fenton Gaming Plays Bars Gate 3. I'm your host, Lord Fenton. In this Bars Gate 3 build video, we're doing the Pure Rogue Thief Deadshot Archer build. As always, like, comment, and subscribe to my channel for more Bars Gate 3 builds like this. Do not forget to hit notification bell so be updated and much more. So, here are the pros and cons of this build. Now, uh, first of all, for the pros. Yeah, you're gonna have you'll be able to take advantage of foes. In other words, you're gonna be moving around the battlefield a lot and using your bow and arrow for that. Number two, you're gonna have very high dexterity. That is really important. Number three is this build is also good for pickpocketing. So in other words, this is also a stealing build as uh, well. Another advantage I really do no love is the height advantage. So if you find a place to get up there really high, that is good. Now disadvantages as follows. You don't want to be up front and center in combat. If you do, yeah, you're going to really suffer badly. Another thing is you're going to have to depend on movement like crazy. Getting the wrong movement, you're kind of screwed. So you know what? Let's uh, go ahead and begin with the character creation process. So uh, let's do go over the races now. Please note, I'm going to go ahead and uh, make a character creation as if I'm creating a new rogue. Now, a Steron works perfectly with this build. You just got to respect him. From the arcane trickster now as for the rest of the leveling up from 2 to 12 Asteron's the person we're going to go ahead and use for that so let's uh, go ahead and not uh, talk about you guessed it the races you can use any other races with this build but it's just my suggestion these are the best races now uh elves in general they have base speed of nine movement that's that's not i mean nine meters they have elven weapon train so long bows short bows uh, long swords and short swords dark vision xc up to 12 meters that's 12 m Fate Ancestry, they have advantage on saving throws against Charm. And the uh, best part is they cannot be put to sleep magically. And if you're going to go high elf like a Steron, then pick the Firebolt level 0 spell. However, I believe the Wood Elf is much more uh, better. This will add your movement speed to 1.5, which is a lot more movement. And plus you get a few skills along with that. They don't tell you that in this uh, race, but still it's uh, good enough. Now the uh, next one I'm going to go ahead and talk about is the Drow. They have Dancing Light that's used for some serious trolling on folks if you want to go that far. Their uh, base racial speed is 9M, 9 meters, which is good. Now, uh, their weapon selection, you could use hand crossbows. You use one in each hand. Some people experiment with that. Not this build, but still, if you want to try it, go for it. Uh, next up is Superior Dark Vision. They can see up to 24M since they've been living under dark. And the same as the elves. They have advantages on saving throws against being charmed and can't be put to sleep magically. Now, the other two sub races, they're just there for story reasons. Are you a uh, Loth Sworn or uh, the other one? It's up to you on those. It depends on uh, how you feel about Mesobranzian, of course. Next up, humans. I picked this one because they're skills, but let's go ahead and go over each. 9 um, M per turn, which is not bad. Yeah, let me uh, make sure I do that right. Okay, that's not bad. Their uh, weapon selection, I'll probably say basically all right. They give you option for a shield, but don't use a shield for this build. Now, human versatility, uh, this does give you an extra skill point. So instead of your normal four for most of the classes, you get one extra. F for this build, it's really useful. Now, uh, next up the bat are the Gith Yankee. This is like the underdog race of Baldur's Gate 3, but they're actually good for this build as uh, well. Now they have astral knowledge, gain proficiency of all to skills of your chosen ability. So you choose that. They get mage hand later on. They get misty step. Really useful, everyone. Seriously. Now they have nine M for movement speed. Uh, I should say base movement. That's good. And they are weapon selection are not bad at all. More of the, I say a little bit of the light and medium armor side. Now uh, next up are the dwarves. The only dwarf I'm going to talk about is the uh, gray one, but I'm going to go over the advantages anyways. First of all, they have 7.5 M per turn. That's good. Not as good as the other big races, but that's fine. They're proficiency with hand axes and light axes and such. Dark vision up to 12 M, which is good for basic dwarves. And they also have a nice advantage on saving throws against poison and resistance to poisons as well. Very good for starting out. Now, if you pick a gray dwarf, you get 24 meters. You see more in the dark. And they have a saving throw resistance. If I remember right, uh, it gets uh, illusions and also being charm or paralyzed, which is a good thing. And later on, they get invisibility, I heard. Now, next up are the half elves. Like they're both racist, they're 9M for us, movement speed. Uh, civil militia, just like the humans. 
which isn't bad at all. Like their Elven uh, counterparts, they can see 12M. That's good. And the same thing, uh, they have nice resistance against Char and cannot be magically put to sleep. Now, if you go uh, half high elf, pick the uh, Firebolt spell, but Wood Elf is the best one of the three. Your movement speed is increased by 1.5. As for uh, Drow Half Out, you get the Dancing Light, the Trolling Star, which is all right. So let's uh, move on to the next one. Halflings, their um, base uh, racial speed is 7.5M per turn when you move. Now they get lucky, so uh, when you roll one or ability check, attack, roll, or save, you get to roll again as if nothing happened. And the uh, other thing is is, uh, is uh, brave. You have advantages on saving throws against being frightened, which is a good thing, everyone. Come on, that's a good thing. And the uh, other one I would pick is not Strongheart. That's more of a tank one. It's half Lightfoot Halfling. You have an advantage on stealth checks. You mess up on stealth checks, most likely you'll roll again or something like that. But still... They're very stealthy. That's what you want for this build. Now, uh, gnomes, uh, they're actually good for uh, one of the races, which I'm going to just quickly uh, change to, and I'm going to go over their advantages and such. So uh, here's the deal. Their uh, base racial speed, they're uh, 7.5M per turn, which is uh, not bad for a small race. Uh, another thing they have advantages on intelligence, wisdom, and charisma check saving throws. That's all gnomes. Uh, it'll help us a bit on uh, those three ability scores. Now, they can see in the dark, which is 24M, which is good. Much more farther, which I love that with this race. And they have advantages on stealth checks. Yeah, they're very sneaky. It's a good thing. Uh, best race, I'll probably say, is definitely Wood Elf, Half Wood Elf. And I'll probably say uh, Human for more skills and such. And there is your sneak attacks. You get melee. We're not going to really use that. We're going to use the other one, sneak attack range. Yeah, they allow you sneak attack range in this game, which is uh, great. Let's go talk about backgrounds. Now, next up to bad is backgrounds. I have three best backgrounds you can pick. Charlatan, you gain Deception and Slay of Hands. Slay of Hands is important. Deception is nice, so this way you get caught, you can talk your way out of it. You can make up an excuse or something like that. So that's one of the ones I like. Criminal is good because you get Deception and Stealth. No slay of hands, but stealth is good as well because you're going to be using that quite a bit for this build. Now, if you want to get to a nitty gritty, you pick Urchin. Urchin is stealth and slay of hands if you want to go uh, that route. I feel like Charlton is the best second Urchin. Then Criminal, of course, is a uh, third for this build. Up to you on that, but the, all one of those three are very good. Now, next up are the ability scores. We're going to focus on Dex as the main one and Constitution as the secondary. We'll put Strength to 9. Because we're kind of forced with that, with with our 27 points. If we uh, decide to, uh, you know, boost that up with Auntie Ethel's eye and we spare her, that'll be to 10 if you want to go that route. Dexterity, that is up to 16. That's going to be our bread and butter. We're going to be leveling that up like crazy. This will also help out with ranged weapons as well. So this will definitely uh, boost us up big time. Constitution, I put at 14, a little bit more hit points for our rogue, which is uh, great. So yeah, that'll be our uh, secondary skill. Intelligence, we'll leave at 8. That's our weak point skill, I hate to say. Wisdom, we're going to put at 14. There's some checks that uh, does uh, require wisdom from the skills, which is a good thing. Same thing with charisma, we're going to put that as 14 as well because of deception. If we decide to pick persuasion to talk our way out, that'll help us out a bit. So let's talk about skills. Now uh, for skills, I'm going to be uh, blunt about it. The best three skills is Slay of Hands, Stealth, and Deception. Go for those. After that, definitely go for Perception. That's another great one as well. Now, if you have another choice you want to make, then I would definitely say is a, another one's Insight, Investigation. Those are all good as well. And I'm just going to show you real quick with the Gith Yankee. This is just a test of the skills that you get limited to. Now, as far as uh, Expertise, I would say Slay of Hands and Stealth. That's the way to go, everyone. Seriously. So, yeah, see, so we're going to pick Stealth, and that's going to be our number uh, three skill. Unless you pick the other one, then, yeah, make sure you pick Deception or Slay of Hands. Now, another one I like is, uh, let's see here, Perception. That's the best one there, so this way you get to see the traps and such. Insight's not bad at all, in case you want to see who's more uh, BSing or such, or there's a Illusion. Yeah, you, there's a few times you use Insight, but Perception, you use that all the time. Spot things are hidden. There you go. Now, if we have one more choice, I would probably say is A, Persuasion, or uh, B, if you uh, definitely uh, want to, Acrobats. And those are the last two are usually good. Acrobats is nice to move around. A has Persuasion, so up to you on that. 
Now, as for expertise, slay of hands and stealth. Go with that. Slay of hands are going to be stealing quite a bit with this build to build off our money. So this way we get to buy those nice ranged weapons and stealth because we're going to be using stealth in combat. And I'm going to show you right now with humans, you got to pick another skill to choose from. So I decided to just leave that persuasion. That's not a good one as uh, well. So, so yeah, pl yeah, playing in humans is a huge advantage. Uh, for now, I'm just uh, quickly, uh, after I'm done with that, go with uh, you uh, guessed it. Being a uh, wood elf, but intimidation is also good too if you want to go that route. But up to you all on that. Let me uh, get rid of that. Switch to uh, the race I want, which is the wood elf. By the way, Asteron's a high elf, so we'll be leveling him up as uh, that. So let's go ahead and just select that. We're all good, set to go. Otherwise, after that, you're going to start a little slow, but once you get to your level 3, 4, and 5, things will move up quickly. Once you start to get better items and such, you can do a lot more damage. And if you know the expertise of the combat and how to position yourself, you're going to do some nice serious damage either to finish off your foes or just weaken your foes enough so your party members definitely finish them off. Now we're done with that. We're going to level up. You see our model, Asteron. He's going to be the one that's going to level up our character from, you guessed it, level 2 to 12. So let's uh, go ahead and start with the, each of the skills. And let's see here. The first one we're going to do is... Cunning action hide. So we get to use that as a class a uh, action. Well, that action will be a bonus action in combat. So in case we attack someone, we'll hide after. Cunning action dash is a bonus action. So we'll uh, increase double our movement speed. Very useful. And disengage. If we buy off more, we chew or we get aggro. We uh, hit that button. And we all proclaim of opportunities of attack. Now uh, next up on the uh, list is, you guessed it, level 3. So ding, level 3. So let's go ahead and select Thief. That's what we do get. Two things out of it. We get ourselves a additional bonus action, which is very good for this build. Very useful. Second story uh, work, that means you gain resistance to falling damage. That's less likely you'll take falling damage because you're learning how to, you know, survive a fall. Now we're at level four. Every level four, we get a feat. Except for rogues, they get another one at 10. Now I'm going to go ahead and do sharpshooter. That's the best way to go. Now, with Sharpshooter, your proficiency uh, with uh, weapons big time, that's range. You have minus five penalty attack rolls. However, you do deal an additional 10 damage. Just like the Great Weapon Mastery, but it's a good one for this uh, setup. And another thing, this is another one I like. Your range uh, weapon attacks do not receive penalties from high ground rolls. So if foe's higher than you, that gets negated. And if you have the high ground, you get a bonus on that. Now, uh, next up is level five, a rogue. Now... This is what we do get. Uncanny uh, dodge. When attack hits you, you only take half the usual damage. That's very good. It's much more powerful than the Neverwinter Knights version of that. Which you get automatically in this game. Now we're at level 6. Ding level 6. So after this level, we're halfway there. Now this is a good try and change your skill. For example, you don't like persuasion. Pop up perception. Up to you on all of that. Yeah, for some reason, Steron don't have uh, perception at all. It's weird, but oh well. Now, uh, next up on the list is our rogue level 7. And look what we do get this time. Evasion. So when a spell or effect would deal half of damage on a successful de dexterity saving throw, it deals no damage at all. Now, if it misses, only half damage. So, so no longer full damage on spells and such. It's either half or none. Now we're at level 8 again. We get to select ourselves another feat, everyone. This is a good thing. Now we're going to do ability improvements. All your ability improvements will be dex. Every single one will be the dexterity. So put those points in dexterity no matter what. That is seriously important for this build. Now we're at level 9. So things are looking out for us. We're doing more damage to our bow and arrow, either the high ground or being sneaky. Supreme Sneak, this is like the invisibility sp uh, spell. What it does is uh, it makes you invisible. Any action you do, including pickpocketing, will get you out of that. This is a nice way to go invisible so you can move around the battlefield more without being seen. Now, only bad side without that is see invisible. But still, let's go to level 10. We get ourselves a, f a free feat because we're a rogue. And uh, two things. Now, if you can't select Lucky or it's been already selected as a Lightfoot Halfling, then uh, I would probably say pick something else. Like, for example, Savage Attacker if you want to go that route. But if not, then the uh, best way to go is lucky. 
You're asking, why Lucky Fenton? Well, here's the deal. You get two things. You can use a luck point to gain advantage, advantage on your next ability check, which is a good thing. That's one. And another thing is that you can use your luck point to gain advantages on your next attack roll or same throws or make an enemy re-roll their attack roll. So if they do a critical hit, you can say, no, roll again. And then they don't. Now uh, we're at level 11, so things are looking really up. And this is what we uh, do get. Reliable talent. So when you make a ability check with a skill you're proficient with, the lowest result will always be 10. So only time well, you'll uh, fail if you get the dreaded one. But other than that, it's uh, 10 and above, which this is very useful for this class, especially if you're disarming traps and such. Now we're on the final level. You guessed it, level 12. And uh, we're going to get ourselves a feat, another ability improvement score. We're going to get dex up to 20. After that, we are definitely done with, you guessed it, leveling up from 1 to 20. So let's go ahead and talk about the next topic for this build. Now, in Baldur's Gate 3, there are three chances to permanently boost your ability score. So I'm going to go through them since they're one in each act. In Act 1, spare Auntie Ethel to get a ability score item from her of your choice. Now, I advise voiding a paladin to uh, get the last hit. Yeah, you have to get her under 10 hit points. Then she'll say, spare me, please, spare me. And then go ahead and, and uh, say yes for that if you want to go that route. Uh, another thing is is uh, you must have a stare on your party unless you're a stare on yourself. Then great. Now you want a stare on by uh, Raja. That is the, I believe she is the alchemy person who's in the Moonrise Towers in Act 2. You let him do uh, that bite, then you'll get a plus two strength potion. By the way, she also does sell some of the best equipment in the game, so definitely hit her uh, up on that as well. Now, last but not least is Act 3. This is what I feel like it's the very best. This is the mirror of loss, everyone. This is great news. There are three possible outcomes, and before we talk about those, do not do deception when you're about to lose a stat. And yet, yeah, if you uh, do that deception, you get nothing, not a zilch. But the deal is uh, you lose a stat, you do be able to remove curse from it. So anyway, here's the three possibilities. Now, if you pass a hidden charisma check, I believe two times, what happens is, is you get a plus one charisma as a bonus. And then after that, immediately after that, you have plus two stat your choice. For this build, dexterity. We're going to boost up dexterity by two with that. My party members abuse this, by the way, quite a bit. Now here's choice number two. Now, if you didn't pass a certain charisma check, you pass another one. You get a plus two stab of your choice, and that's it. So definitely go for dexterity. Now, if you mess up on both charisma checks, you get nothing, not it. You just get the loss, and that's about it. So I'm going to go ahead and do a demonstration of, you uh, guessed it, the potion of strength and how uh, well it is. Normally, the potion of strength is just really used just for a melee uh, characters or classes, like, for example, a paladin, barbarian, and, of course, a fighter. You can use a free rogue if you want to uh, go with that route, which is uh, fine. Ranger as well loves to use that in Monks too. So uh, you uh, want to do in Act 2 is uh, let Asteron bite her, and then after that, the person uh, you want to use the uh, potion, they'll get a plus 2 strength off the bat. See, there's your plus 2 strength there, and that's how you uh, definitely get that in Act 2. Let's talk about the Mirror Loss. Here's the deal about the mirror law. So after passing some religion and or arcana checks, which is usually two of them with intelligence. Yeah, if you want to respect your uh, character for intelligence, then go ahead and go for uh, that. Once you uh, do uh, that, then uh, what happens next is uh, you'll uh, pick two stats to take away. Do something like wisdom or charisma, or I say basically wisdom or, or uh, constitution. That's the best way to go. Now, once you uh, get the pass check like this, here's what each of the positives you get. Number one, that is plus two strength. Number two is plus two dexterity. Number three is plus two constitution. Number four is plus two intelligence. Number five is plus two wisdom. And number six is plus two charisma. So that's what you get on the positive side permanently. And those numbers are a maximum up to 24, by the way. And yeah, you'll get cursed with the stat you lost. Like I said before, remove curse is the way to uh, go. And it's not that hard to uh, do. So that's about it for uh, permanent ability score boosts. I'm going to show you the before and after. Here we go. Now here's the before and after with the permanent stat boosts. So before you get 9 strength, 
dexterity at 20 because you've been leveling up 2 to 12 as if you're a level 12 person or character constitution 14 intelligence 8 wisdom 14 and charisma 14 so after i uh, use the three uh i say acts of the permanent stat boosts here we go you decide to go for uh strength so for example you decide to pick auntie ethel to even things out for the hair for strength and then the strength potion if you drink that that'll be 12 strength otherwise it'll still stay at 9 or uh, 10 depending on if you did auntie ethel or not and you gave the strength potion to someone else dexterity 22 thanks to the mirror of loss uh, another thing is charisma at 14 intelligence at 8 wisdom at 14 and, uh, charisma at 14 15 if you pass that hidden check so we're uh, done with the permanent stat boosts for each act next up is the tadpole powers here are the tadpole powers i do definitely suggest you all should use for this build i separate into two categories before using the astral touch tadpole and after so let's go with before first so you say to consume some tadpoles. So anyways, here are some uh, powers. Favorable beginnings. Boost attack rolls or gives you advantage in dialogue. So here's the deal. This is really great. Uh, I'm going to say it. I use it for all my builds. This one. I feel like this is the best utility one for the before section. Next up is charm. Prevents a foe attacking you for one turn. So if a foe comes towards you, you charm them. Next turn, that foe will attack someone else. So this way you get in a position or hide. So that's a very good way to do that. Shield of Thralls, make a shield on you or your allies that has 10 hit points. When those 10 hit point shields goes bye-bye, any foes in that area get stunned. This is a great way, I do mean great way to stun your foes. So this way you move around somewhere else and definitely hide. Now next up is Psionic Backlash. When a foe casts a spell, you uh, do 1d4 damage per caster level. Now this is uh, great if you're facing against tough casters. Just remember, you're in a stealth, you get popped out of it. So just a uh, uh, warning on that. Drain ability, attack can either drain strength or dexterity if you're doing range. Now for this build, you're going to be doing a lot of range, so you're going to be draining that dexterity like crazy. That's just on the uh, first attack. It's a great uh, tadpole power to use. Now let's go to the next section of tadpole powers, of course. Now, welcome to the dark side of force where you get wondrous powers and you get to abuse. Oh wait, that's something else. Anyways... Here's after you consume that Astral Touch Tadpole. Black Hole, this is a OP AoE attack. Now, this has five charges. However, it does a lot of damage. I abused this in Endgame. Many foes did fail by this Black Hole, one of it. And then sometimes I'd do another, and they die. So it's like one, two-shot foes. It's very powerful. Now, uh, Fly, gain ability to fly. This is great because you zip around the battlefield. You, For example, uh, you uh, took out a foe using your sneak attack then you can fly up after you take them out on the high ground and then start shooting another one the next round repulse sword this is aoe push back attack that does damage any folks get your race around you you go ahead and push them back and then run away like crazy and try to hide so this way they won't find you free cast next ability spells or anything else is free of charge to use so for example using supreme sneak you don't want to use it up and wait for short rest tap free cast and do supreme sneak and go invisible it's great for that and that's the one I always tell people to use is that one from now on now absorb intellect gobble up a foe's intel intellect and lowering their intelligence by one point per turn and heals your wounds for five that's minus five intelligence total and uh, each uh, round heals you is 1d8 which is good this is like a very nice ability to heal yourself up after that you go into stealth and recover some more so that's it for tap hole powers let's talk about gear of ice Here are some gear advice. I'm going to go ahead and tell everyone. Here's the deal. I split up into two categories. Gear by the end of Act 1 you should have before entering the Shadow Curse Lands. And end game gear before going to Rowboat. Now, please note if it has a number, like for example, Act 1, 2, or 3, do not leave said Act and Area until you get said item. So let's go ahead and start with the first one by the end of Act 1. Let's do go over the headpieces. They're all similar, like my dual wielding rogue. With exception of one of them, you'll see down the line. Shadow of Mesobranzian. This will gain the Shroud and Shadow ability. This is exactly the same as the Invisibility spell. Uh, again, Invisibility spell, you cast on yourself. You do any action, you pop out of Invisibility. It lasts 10 turns. Loot it from the Pell Corpse in the Mitochondrite Colony in Act 1. That's in the Underdark. Must help out the colony for access to the body or slaughter the camp. So this way you get access as well. 
up to you on which way you go. Now here's a good alternative. The Haste Helm gains momentum for three rounds. That means much more movement. That's good for a rogue. Lock Chest in Blight Village in Act 1. Let's move on to the next one. Spire Silk Armor, you gain advantage on Constitution saving throws, plus one bonus to stealth checks. This is great for this build. Mithara drops this in the Shower Sanctuary in Act 1. You can knock her out and steal her armor as well if you want to go that route. Or get her to, uh, you know, join her your cause by helping her cause first. Uh, either one of those three you could do. Now, uh, next up is the alternative. Drow Studded Leather, plus one stealth. Heavy chest near the Festering Cove entrance and the Underdark in Act 1. Yeah, this is a nice alternative to have. Plus one stealth is always good. Let's move on to the next uh, set. Now, uh, this is definitely different than the dual wielding one with the gloves. Gloves of archery, you gain proficiency with long bows and short bows. In addition, your ranged weapon attack deals additional 2 damage. So, add 2 to your normal damage, which is good. Goblin Trader Grat in the Goblin Camp in Act 1 sells this. He also sells a whole bunch of good stuff too. And also some nice stuff you get dust as well for Gale. If you want to go that route, of course. Now here's the nice alternative. Gloves of Hail of Thorns. Hail of Thorns spell shoots a volley of thorns. The thorns deal weapon damage to the target. Then explodes. The explosion deals an additional 1d10 piercing damage to the target and surrounding creatures. On miss, the thorns still explode. However, on save throws... Target still takes half the damage from the explosion. So that's one of the five damage. So by Brim in the Zent's Hideout in Act 1. So in order to get to the Zent's Hideout, you got to do a missing shipment quest. Kill the Knolls after you uh, do uh, just that. Talk to the uh, Zent's there and say, yeah, you're all right. Then they'll tell you about their hideout to go to and such. And if you uh, didn't help them out, you have to go through some checks in order to uh, go through a hideout without killing anyone. So let's move on. We're going to go ahead and talk about the boots, especially this one. Disintegrating Nightwalkers can't be in web, entangled, or ensnared. And also can't slip on grease or ice as well. Gain Misty Step like the spell. Yeah, that's right. You teleport around, which is a good thing. True Sword Nier drops this in the Grimforge Iron Dark area in Act 2. Yeah, kill True Sword Nier. Those boots are definitely yours. And in fact, they've been carrying me through the entire game with a stare on. Here's a good alternative. Linebreaker Boots. Once per turn, when you dash, you gain Wrath for two turns. Wrath is when you gain a bonus to plus one damage with melee weapons. And I just got that for athletics. That's another good one as well for the athletics part. That's the only boots I could definitely uh, find for that. Warg Pens in the Shadow Sanctuary in Act 1. That's where it's at. Dropped by Beastmaster Zerk. Honorable mention, there is a uh, boots underneath the Bly Village that makes you immune to web. Just like the... Uh, um, I should say the uh, boots of uh, the disintegrating uh, night walkers. Okay, we're done with that. Let's move on. Next up, the bat is for necklaces, moon drop pendant. When the wearer has 50% hit points or less, they do not provoke attacks of opportunity. Now, I'm going to say this right now. This is really great because uh, let me explain about this. So, attacks of opportunity is uh, when you try to move around a foe, they attack you. Now, if you're under 50% hit points, that's uh, wonderful because you'll be moving around quite a bit to try to, you know, either go on the side of the foe or uh, definitely the back. Try not to get the front just in case they do some kind of cleave or something. That's bad for a rogue. Now, uh, in order to get this, solve the Sloon Magic Chest puzzle in the Owlbear Cave in Act 1. You have to get a special prayer sheet. I think it's religion or perception or something like that to discover it. Once that happens, read the sheet. You go open the chest and this necklace is yours. And make sure uh, Shadow Heart is near, not near you when you do this. So this way you don't get her disapproval. Now here's a good alternative. Amulet of Misty Step. Gain Misty Step. Spell to use. Just like Misty Step. Teleport around. In the Shadow Sanctuary at True Sword Gut uh, Quarters in Act 1. Yeah, you could definitely get to her quarters without, of course, going through the lock. There's ways to do that. Let's move on to the rings. Now, for the rings, I decided to go for two. Crusher band, movement speed, plus 3M. Steal or loot uh, Crusher to get this ring in the Goblin Cap in Act 1. Another one, this is very good for a rogue. Uh, this is a caustic band. You deal plus two acid damage to foes. Jarthus Bone Cloak sells this at the Mitochondria Colony under Dark in Act 1. Yeah, that colony has a bunch of good vendors there. Definitely go ahead and get it. And that plus two acid is nice. Now, here's some good alternatives. I feel like that's great for this build. 
Ring of Absolute Force. Use Thunder. It's like the Thunder Wave spell. If you're Absolute Branded, you add one to the damage. Sergeant Thrin in the Grinforge Underdark area in Act 1 drops this. Or so. Yeah, either kill him or have someone else kill him. The next up is the Spark Wall. Cannot be electrocuted. Electric resistance increases. This is in the Arcade Tower basement under Dark in Act 1. Solve the entire tower to get to the top. And after that, once all that is done, do some more stuff, then get to the bottom. And inside the basement, there's some good loot. Loot everything up. Let's move on to the main hand weapons. Or I say main hand and offhand. Now you're saying this is an archery build. Why are you putting these uh, weapons here? So let me go ahead and uh, say this uh, now. I'm just using these just for the stat stuff. Sometimes they have uh, other stuff on it too. Here, here we go. Knife of the Undermountain King. This is a short sword plus two. Wielder scores a critical hit when rolling a 19. When they uh, roll a two, uh, damage or less, they re-roll the dice, taking the highest results. You have advantage on attack rolls against uh, lightly or heavy obscure targets when using this blade. This one's not bad at all. So in case you're forced into going to melee, this is the way to go. Now, uh, I think I can't pronounce her name. Uh, she's a vendor in the Mountain Pass Get the Yankee Crash. She sells this in Act 1. Also, she does sell the Gloves of Dexterity. Go ahead and buy that as uh, well because you're going to probably use the plus one attack in case uh, you get in game with the other gloves, which is good. Another one, this is a good one for an offhand. Hunter's Dagger plus one dagger on a hit. Target must have a DC 13 Constitution saving throw or become ruptured. Again, you get forced in a situation, can't use a bow or uh, I say ranged weapon. Yeah, use a, you have to go melee. Or sometimes people use the bow and then they use the offhand. Now, uh, this is uh, sold by Rogue Moon Glow in the Shadow Sanctum in Act 1. Yeah, it's the uh, little halfling that sells it. A very sneaky one, by the way. You'll see throughout the game. Let's move on. Now, here's a good alternative. Short Sword of First Blood deals an additional 1 through 8 piercing damage to targets that still have all their hit points. Around the Underdark Beach in uh, Underdark in Act 1. Uh, here's the deal. It's not a bad one to have, and uh, it's not hard to find. It's the same beach where you fight some Grey Dwarves. Or uh, try to talk away and get in their ship. Now here's the NX one. This is just optional. Uh, either go for plus one daggers or short swords in case you can't find any other weapons. They're various throughout the act. Now let's go to the ranged weapons. That's what we're really here for, right? Here's some of my suggestions you should definitely use. Bow of the Banshee. Plus one short bow on a hit. Possibly inflict Frighten. You also gain 1d4 extra damage against Frightened targets. So you frighten a foe for a few rounds. Next round. You could do some more extra damage, especially if you're definitely uh, good at the uh, sneak attack. Kulsar Grey Moon in the Grim Forge sold uh, or uh, drops this in Act One. This is our Underdark Part Two, by the way. I call it. You want to buy this first, yeah. Buy everything from him for uh, killing him if you have to. Here's a nice alternative: Jolt Shooter. When the wielder deals damage using this weapon, they gain two lightning charges. Each charge is a plus one attack rolls and plus one lightning damage. Now, total for that max is 5 and 5. After 5 charges, you deal an additional 1d8 uh, lightning damage, which is good. After that, it resets again. A very nice DPS bow. Now, this is one of the three rewards for saving Consular Froric at the Burning Inn in Act 1. So, you save her, escort her out there safely, you get this nice free bow. Let's move on to the end game gear. Here's the end game gear. Once again, I'm going to give everybody a nice and friendly reminder. If it says Act 2 or Act 3, do not leave the Act in area until you get the said item. So here we go. Mask of Soul Perception. This is headgear, by the way. Gain a plus 2 bonus to the following. Attack rolls, initiative rolls, and perception check. Those three for a rogue, very nice. Dual wielding or archery type. Gain detect thoughts. That's a bonus. This is in the Devil's Feeds Upstairs to Steal in Act 3. Yeah, so you got to get to pass security, then, uh, of course, uh, open the door, and then steal the sucker. Next up, here's a good alternative, Hell Dusk Helm. Infernal Sight, you can see in a magical and ordinary darkness up to a range of 12 meters. You cannot be blinded as well. Very useful for a rogue build, by the way. You cannot be critical hit upon. Again, really useful. Plus two save throws against spells, and that's a nice bonus. Now you get this uh, feature, Seer and Frightens a Target with nothing but your Growler. That means you deal additional 2d8 fire damage against burning creatures. Now this is in a lock room in the House of Hope in Act 3. Do not leave the House of Hope without it. Let's move on. Let's talk about the cloaks, not the one that Batman wears, but still, you get the point. 
Shade Slayer Cloak, while hiding, the number you need to roll a critical hit while attacking is reduced by one. Now, this effect stacks. It stacks with the potion and any other item, especially with this uh, in-game gear. Yet, your critical hit, you're going to be doing more often with it. Now, uh, this is uh, sold by Sticky Dondo in the Lower City Sewers Guild Hall in Act 3. Play cool with the guild. This shop is good, and they're good allies. Now, here's a good alternative, Cloak of Protection. This is plus one AC and plus one saving throws as well. Sold by Quartermaster Tally at the last light in an Act 2. And yeah, I'm going to say this right now. Yeah, that plus one AC is always nice. But still, raid Quartermaster Tally stuff after you do it, steal her goal. I'm just saying, let's move on. Now let's talk about the chest set. Or say chest pieces. Elegant studded leather. This uh, gains you a plus two bonus on initiate rolls, advantages on stealth check, allows you to cast shield once uh, every short rest, just like the reaction spell. So here's the deal. This is in the high security vault number nine in the counting house in Act Three. It's in the high vault area. So you have to go through talking checks and such. Clear the room out of vault cultists. After that, you have access to the vault if you want to definitely steal some stuff from it. Now my advice on the other uh, gear is uh, this. The uh, two of them from Act 1, they're good alternatives. Now, I didn't do the Ballist Armor because uh, some people will not uh, go all the way with the Murder Tribunal. If you do, second best gear is the Ballist Armor. In fact, it might be the best one with the Elegant Studded Letter. Up to you if you want to go through that. I didn't list it in this video for those, like I said once again, who don't want to go full nine all the way with Ball. Let's move on. Now, here's these gloves. Gloves of Soul Catching, your unarmed attack deals an additional 1d10 force damage. We're not going to use that. We're going to use this as however, not the first part. Once per turn on an unarmed hit, you regain 10 hit points. Now, alternatively, we're going to be using this. You may forego the healing to gain advantage on attack rolls and saving throws until the end of your next turn. Yeah, that's what we're going to be using for that. And also, we're going to use the plus 2 constitution. That's up to 20 maximum. Now, this is a reward for saving Hope in the House of Hope in Act 3. She has to be alive when you fight the final battle there. Here's a good alternative I really love. This is for you poison type of people who loves to use poison. Poisoner's Gloves. Wherever you deal poison damage, the target needs to see a constitution saving throw or becomes poison. Yeah, that's right. You get to poison someone with this. Back in, in the House of Healing in Act 2. It's a little house behind it. Either Jimmy the Lock or somehow if you get a key, go ahead and go into it. Good place to loot. Do not leave Act 2 without it. Now, batters up the boots. I'm going to say this. This is still from Act 1, disintegrating Nightwalkers. I feel like that is still the best. Hold on to those. Now, if you want to hold on to those, you find something better. You don't want to give it to your party members. Here's this one. All dust boots cannot be moved by magical or normal means. And you're also immune to difficult terrain, which is double positive. When you felt a saving throw, you can use your reactions to seed instead. Another good thing. Teleport to an area you do 2, 2d16 worth of damage. In that area, that is fire damage. Uh, that is not bad at all. Lord Gortash's room in Act 3 has this. You have to kill Lord Gortash or steal from him the key in order to get or else Jimmy the lock in the chest if you uh, can. Let's move on. Now we're on the necklaces. So I feel like this is the best two. Amulet of Greater Health. Constitution is set to 23. Advantage on Constitution saving throws you get in the archives at the House of Hope in Act 3. Don't leave the area without. That's where the Orphic Hammer is at. So grab that as well. Also get the Gauntlets of Hill Giant Strength, which gives you 23 strength. And hand it to someone else. Here's a good off turn. Surge and Subjugation Amulet. When scoring a critical hit on a humanoid where it can be paralyzed, the target for two turns. Long rest applies after. This is real nice. You can paralyze a foe and then go all critical hit on them. Malice Storm drops this at the House of Healing in Act 2. Either a normal combat, or if you're very smart, go through dialogue. Shower Heart is the likely one that will talk him into killing himself. Very entertaining. Let's move on. I'm going to go over the rings. Not the rings of power or the one ring. They're very cool, though, if you have either one of those. Killer Sweetheart, when you kill a creature, your next attack roll will become a critical hit automatically. Long rest applies after... Self same trial in the Gauntlet of Shard in Act 2. Do not leave that trial without getting the ring. Don't grab the uh, orb because usually that ring is on your car carbon copy. Seriously, best ring in the game. I'm just trying to be nice here, everyone. Ring of Regeneration. At the start of combat, you regenerate 1 to 4 hit points. 
Ronan or someone else is there. We'll sell this in Act 3 at the Sorcerer's Sundry. So, yeah, buy that inventory out. There is some great stuff there. Now, here's a good alternative. I decided to list as well. Ring of Free Action, you know the effects of difficult terrain. Cannot be paralyzed or restrained. Those are three positives right there automatically. That NPC potion lady you uh, met in Act 2 that you got the strength potion from, she sells this in Moonrise Tower. Like I said before earlier with the strength potion, clean out her inventory. She has some good stuff in it. Last but not least is the Shifting Corpus Ring. Cast Blurred, like the spell, and Invisibility, like the spell. Long rest for each of them. That's really worth it, especially Invisibility. Flame Fist Marcus drops this at the last light in an Act 2. Either kill him, or if you see him later on, side, uh, side with him, attempt to uh, pickpocket this ring. Let's move on to the main hand and offhand weapons. Again, we're using some of these uh, weapons, as you guessed it, just to hold on, just like getting the stats from uh, some of them. Now, the Crimson Mischief, this weapon deals an additional 1d4 piercing damage against targets with 50% hit points or fewer. Weapon enchantment plus 5. Main hand only, when you deal advantage attack, you deal plus 7 piercing damage. Offhand only, when you attack with your offhand, your ability mod gets added to the damage. So if your dex mod 7, add plus 7 damage to your weapon on that. We'll be using that from time to time as well if we wanted to. Drop by or in the red in Act 3. Plus Thirst, this is a plus 2 enchantment knife, or say dagger. Number for a critical hits need is reduced to 1, stacks with the others, that's why we'll be using that for that. Main hand only, foes hit with this is weak to piercing damage. Offhand, when a creature misses you, you can cast True Strike like the spell. Reward for defeating or in the red. Yeah, she has some good stuff. Let's move on to some alternatives. Rhapsody, this is a plus one dagger, came plus one attack rolls and spells save DC. Max stats on those is three every time you use that to attack. Possibly inflict bleeding when hitting a creature with this weapon while hiding or being invisible. Casador drops this in Act 3. Kill Casador, you get this nice dagger. Here's a nice alternative. You should use it in your main hand. Uh, plus 2 sh uh, sword, sword, which is the Sword of Life Stealing. On a critical hit, target takes an extra 1 to 10. Necro damage, green damage, that's what it is, as long as it's not undead or a construct. You also gain 10 hit temporary hit points from that. Damien sells this at the last light in Act 2. If you're lucky, he will still have it. Now, let's get to the real part of this endgame gear that you really came here for. Let's be honest, the ranged weapons. Now you have the finger of the gods in your hand. I mean your uh, bows and arrows and crossbows and such. Let's go on with that. Gaunt, uh, May, I might have pronounced it. It's a plus three longbow. It's a legendary one. Inflicts guiding light upon the target for being hit with the said bow, just like the spell, gain a special haste without all the bad after effects. So in other words, you get the extra Action, AC, movement, you name it. You don't get no uh, bad stuff uh, with this. Long rest applies, of course. This object shines with a, a glowing light and a raise of 6 meters. Steel Watcher Titan drops this in Act 3 at the Steel Watch Foundry. You gotta defeat the Titan and get this nice baby. Now, here's a very good alternative in case you don't want to be like a beacon. The Dead Shot. Plus 2 Longbow, number you need to roll a critical hit is reduced by 1. This stacks, by the way. So you don't want to use the legendary one. This is a great alternative because number one, you uh, guess that you get that get more often do critical hits. You especially want this with this build. The wilder doubles their proficiency when rolling ranged attacks with this weapon unless they have a disadvantage. We're going to keep ourselves at advantage at all times. So by Fritz, the firecracker in Lower City in Act Three, she's Carlac's friend and bought all of her stuff. In fact, she has some good inventory there as well. That's about it. You uh, guessed it for gear. So next part of this build video we're talking about is thieving gear. Yeah, we're going there. Next up, everyone, is you guessed it, pickpocketing gear. Now, this is the gear I'm going to go ahead and suggest that you should definitely get. Now, uh, make sure you do not leave said act until you get said gear. I'm going to go lift some of the pickpocketing features in it, not all of it. So here we go. The Graceful Cloth get plus 2 Dexterity, max on that is 20. Now uh, this gear is very nice towards the beginning of the game, mainly in Act 1. Helps you out pickpocketing greatly. Now Lady Esther sells this at the Mountain Pass in Act 1. Go ahead and buy it there. Also buy anything else from her as well. Smuggler's Ring, this is a Stealth plus 2, Slay of Hands plus 2, and Charisma minus 1. That's the downside. It's in a hidden bush that has a hidden skeleton there by a broken bridge at the Risen Road in Act 1. 
this is a very powerful ring for your pickpocketing stuff. I missed out on it. If I would have had it, yeah, pickpocketing would have been a thousand times more easier. Gloves of Thievery, Advantage on Slayer Hand Checks, sold by Brim at the Zents Hideout in Act 1. Same thing, complete the missing shipment quest by siding with the Zents after killing the Gnolls. Once you uh, go ahead and uh, do that, visit their hideout and buy everything from Brim. Now, uh, next up, this is a nice alternative, in case you uh, can't get that one. Gloves of Power, Slayer Hands Plus One, Goblin Boss, Zach Krug drops this in Act 1 at the Druid's Grove entrance. That's a, when you first get to the Druid's Grove entrance. There's a battle there. Loot his corpse up. Now, uh, this one is really good. However, it's going to take some gold and luck on RNG. Unlucky Thieves Glove. Slay a hands plus two. Steal too many times by getting a two many coal. And you will be burning yourself. Akibaz Wheel of Fortune at the Circus of the Last Days in Act 3 has this as well. Now, in order to counter the effect of burning, you want this one. Reverse Rain Cloak. Constant wet effect used to counter the burning, like I said before. Same as the Unlucky Thieves Glove to get. Again, RNG plays into effect. So, uh, Akibaz Wheel of Fortune game at the Circus Last Day, you have to do. Do not leave those until you get the two of them. Keep playing until you get both. And that's about it for pickpocketing gear. With this gear... I'm going to say well, one more time about it. It helps you greatly increase your odds of stealing what you need to steal. Mainly a lot of gold or certain items. Let's move on to potions, oils, and elixirs. Now, for alchemy items, you definitely want to abuse, this, especially the oils with this uh, build. So let's go with the potions first. Healing potions of all types are a must. So if, for example, your druid or cleric's dead, you definitely want to chug it up with healing potions to heal yourself. Now this is one of the most abused potions in the entire game. Potion of Haste, gain extra action, plus two AC, advantage on dex saving throws. Since you have high dex, you're going to get some, some nice edge a lot more. And double movement speed. I abused this quite a bit on some tough encounters, and let me tell you, it things went my way. So next up is Potion of Flying, same as a flying spell. This way you can move around. For example, you use your sneak attack, kill a foe, there's another one distracting another party member then go uh, fly to that foe next up is potion invisibility invisibility on yourself for 10 rounds any action breaks this this is not only used to position yourself on combat also greatly used you guess to help you pickpocketing items yeah uh, abuse is like crazy next up elixirs let's go over the elixirs the elixir of vigilance gain a plus five bonus to initiative and you cannot be surprised at all this is great for your character, especially your rogue. So if your other party members are caught flat foot, you won't be. Now next up is the Elixir of Viciousness. Increase your chance to land a critical hit by one. Now some of the gear we have is uh, increase your chance to land a critical hit by one. On the dice roll, those things stack. Use this potion and stack it with any of the other gear so you make a crit gear. Now uh, last but not least is the Elixir of Bloodlust. Upon killing foe, you get a... Five plus hit points temporarily and extra bonus action. This is really good. You kill someone, you move on to the next foe to kill. I like this one a lot. Let's go to talk about oils. Oil of accuracy, coat your weapon with this bonus of plus two and attack rolls. This is really useful. You can do that to bows as well. Wizard Bane's oil, its target receives a minus three penalty to spell attack rolls and spell save DC. And you also give your foe who's a spellcaster disadvantage on saving throws from maintaining concentration for two turns. You want to use this oil on casters that are really annoying. Let's, for example, a caster likes to use chain lightning, pop this sucker if your weapon connects. Yeah, next time they try to use chain lightning and maintain it, they won't be able to. Now, uh, my final advice on oils is this. Any or all poisons you definitely want to take advantage of. Use your uh, weaker poisons on yard trash foes or easy foes. As for mini bosses, sub bosses, and big time bosses, use the best stuff like the uh, purple worm toxin. That's about it for potions, oils, and elixirs. Let's move on to arrows. Yes, we're going to talk about that. In Baldur's Gate 3, you will get arrows. These arrows are really powerful if used correctly. And yeah, in case uh, enemies are out of your you guess that your sneak attack range, you definitely want to use these arrows. So let's go ahead and talk about all of these. First of all, all Slayer arrows, yes, the purple ones usually. Now, these certain arrows will have bonus damage against the type that it is. So, for example, if you have Arrow of Undead Slaying, you do double damage against the undead with those arrows. Let me tell you, these arrows are very OP and you should definitely save those for big bosses. I wrecked so many uh, bosses with some of these arrows. 
In fact, uh, one of them I definitely use a against a certain undead one with the undead slaying one. Yeah, those arrows really did a lot of damage. I used it with a Steron, by the way. Now, uh, next one are elemental ones. Make sure you go for the elemental ones for the proper time to use it. Proper time, for example, you're facing a lava or fire elemental, you should switch to ice to do some bonus damage against those type of foes. Uh, same thing as uh, hitting, uh, uh, I think, lightning arrows against uh, foes who are me metallic or wearing metallic armor. Arrow appears saying uh, hits many targets with this arrow, so if you aim for one foe, it goes through that one. It can aim against any other foe that's in its path. These arrows are really powerful, that's all I'm going to say, and you can shoot through foes with it. Arrow of many targets. This is like an AoE type of arrow. It attacks many targets at once. Smoke power arrows can do high damage like a bomb and pushes foes back. It's a nice arrow to uh, do some high damage and push them back far. Arrow of transposition can teleport to the spot you shoot at. This is a nice arrow to move from one place to another if you do not want to use your misty step items and such. That's about it for arrows. Let's talk about combat and thieving demonstration next. It is time to talk about sneak attacks aka advantages. Now as always make sure you have someone who is a tank or a distraction. In this case my paladin. So while my paladin is distracting this ugly ogre. I'm going to go ahead and move around and use sneak attack with my bow and arrow. Yes you could do that with that. Sometimes you do land a hit. Some other times you do a miss. And uh, sometimes when you bite off more than you can chew. You just got to watch it. And uh, there. We're just going to go ahead and hit the disengage. And this way... I don't get in no trouble, no foul at all. Still, you just gotta make sure you are definitely not the target. Someone like this paladin here is the target. And another thing, if you're having issues with, of course, doing sneak attacks, look for a high ground to attack with your bow and arrow. You heard me right, high ground on that. Now, if there's some really tougher foes, you know those arrows I did mention, abuse those. I use those to get me out of certain sticky situations. So let me uh, go ahead and uh, get the other two rounds are done and clear everything else out and show you one more time on uh, if you're very effective with the sneak attack. Why, of course, your paladin is the distraction dummy. Yeah, we'll let these uh, fools get close to us. And while we do that, my paladin will be a distraction. And yep, he's distracting. So let me go over here this way and use the sneak attack with the bow and arrow. This should definitely go ahead and do it. There you go. Almost near death. And if I wanted to, I could do something else. But for now, I'm going to end the turn, and that should definitely be it. Let's go ahead and talk about next is, of course, you uh, guessed it, stealing. Now, for uh, stealing, I'm going to give some uh, pointers. As always, when you're about to steal, make sure you have a party member with guidance. You're asking Fenton, why is uh, guidance? Well, it gives you a, a bonus, and of course, when you're stealing. Number one, uh, two, make sure you're wearing your pickpocketing gear. Yes, you're going to need pickpocketing gear in order to steal. Number three, uh, make sure you use your uh, stealth or you have issue with that invisibility potion. Split everybody up when you do this so uh, this way you're about, about to steal. Let me demonstrate that now. Now, as always, uh, go to merch ship, buy all the items. Afterwards, steal the gold. That's the best way to make some money. And uh, after that... You'll uh, make so much money that it'll be stockpiled. Just don't do it uh, after a second time because they're starting to catch on. And if you can't steal the gold, steal some value like a ring and such. And yeah, definitely remember to get out of the way and far enough. If not, they'll follow you and then you have to pass a dialogue check. So uh, definitely remember, be sneaky. Make sure you watch out for the red and steal when it's right and run away when it's done. Let's go ahead and talk about some final advice before I end the video. Here's some final advice before I do end this build video. Number one, this is very important. Make sure you have someone as a distraction. For instance, Helson and my Paladin are two good distractions. Uh, make sure you use your sneak attack with your bow and arrow. You can do that as long as you're in a close range. See, already we uh, took near taking that fool out. All we need to do is just do either one more hit another way or another. If not, we'll use another character to uh, do so. Even if you don't take out foes, you're the one that will soften them up just enough to go ahead and kill them. Uh, another thing is, if you can't do any sneak attacks, you're having issues, find a high ground, and definitely ping them with arrows on a height. Yeah, speaking of arrows, definitely abuse those like crazy. They are grateful. I should say definitely with this build, especially the Slayer ones. Another thing about pickpocketing, this is uh, very important. Make sure uh, you uh, buy all the items there as much as you can, then steal the uh, gold. 
Now, don't do it too many times because they'll uh, catch on. Yeah, gold is always the one that's easier to steal than jewelry and such. Another thing about stealing is uh, their inventory will fill up the next day when you rest in the camp fully, which is uh, good. Also, with this build, you'll be able to disarm traps with ease. And also, at times, spot them too. Well, everyone, this is it for my Baldur's Gate 3 Pure Rogue Thief Deadshot Archer build video. This is Lord Pent signing off. Thanks for watching and have a great day or night. Do please stay safe. Please subscribe to my channel for more classic and modern Dungeons & Dragons walkthroughs, builds, guides, and more just like this. If you like what you see, then uh, go ahead and pick my suggestion on the upper left-hand corner or YouTube suggestion on the bottom left-hand corner. I'm going to go ahead and relax in this nice chair.